Well, some of you might be visiting with us, some of you might be new, but again, my name is Pastor Jamie, and over the last two years, um, I have had health issues like you wouldn't believe. I used to blame my wife because she's a kindergarten teacher, and well, let's be honest, kids carry everything. <laughs> and so I thought well, what I was experiencing was just a weak immune system. I thought what I was experiencing was just excessive bad luck, whatever you want to call it. But the reality of it is, I am suffering from a disease in my spine that is slowly crippling me. And regardless of how well I eat, how much yoga I do, how many things I do right, this is happening to me. Um, I just had a surgery a few weeks ago to save my right leg <laughs> from losing all sensation and feeling. And look, it worked. <laughs> you can clap for that if you want. I won't be kicking field goals anytime soon, but I'm still proclaiming the gospel. But what's happening to me is happening to me. And I want to tell you, I am not excited about it. I want to tell you that as the doctor, as he sat in the room with my wife and I, and we finally, after years of trying to figure out what was going on with my body, have narrowed it down to the, to the real culprit, there was some relief. But then when they started to tell me what I'm looking forward to, I'm not happy. I'm not joyous. I'm miserable. And I want you to know that when the Word of God tells us that we're to find joy in our suffering, that when we're to consider it all pure joy, it's not talking about the pain itself. There is no joy in cancer. There is no joy in the actual death of a loved one. There's joy in the promise and the hope that God gives us in those moments. We can be joyous. We can walk in the basement of the church and someone say, how you doing? And I can say without a smile, with a smile on my face, I'm doing terrible. And it's okay. You see, we live in a culture and a society today, especially in the Western world, where we have made it unacceptable to tell people how you're actually feeling. We have made it almost like a sign of weakness to say, I don't feel good. And I'm going to tell you that's unbiblical and incorrect. We have got to stop pretending like everything is okay, and we need to begin as brothers and sisters in Christ telling the truth of how we really feel. I am mad about having this spinal disease. I don't feel good about having this spinal disease. Do you know what it's like to have to have your 13-year-old child pick you up out of the dog bowl because you fell? It strips a man of his dignity. Being told you can no longer hunt and fish, and the things that identified you as a man's man. I can go play Pokemon Go now. Do you know what that does to a man? Do you know what that can do to a person's soul? There's a lot of you in this room who can shake your head yes, because you do. You've been there. The pain is not good. The pain is awful. I hate it. But God is good. And in that, I can still find joy because I am not identified by my pain. I don't know what you walked in here with today. I don't know what you walked in here carrying, what kind of sickness, what kind of brokenness, marriage issues. I don't care what it is. I want you to know your pain is real and it's okay that it hurts. You don't have to pretend like everything's okay. And for the love of God, tell someone it hurts. As believers in Christ, we are called to be open and honest with one another. And so if you walk through the basement of the church or down the street and you ask someone how they're doing and simply walk on by, you can't do that. I'm going to call you out in this church. If we ask someone how they're doing, we should... Be the people of God and stop and actually listen because the truth of the matter is God wants you to tell your story. God wants you to talk about your pain. He doesn't want you to hide your pain. He wants you to own it. If you simply hide your pain, it will become a cancer in itself and it will consume you. 
but I wish I could tell you this from this place as a person who's mastered this. I'm struggling with this. Because I want to say that I'm fully relying on God, but there's been a lot of tears. There's been a lot of questions. But you know what? It's okay. God's big enough to handle them. And I don't know what your pain is. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time for us to stop being silent. You know, I used to think that maybe I wasn't tough if I shared my pain. Now listen, I'm not telling us to go around moping and complaining. We're not called to be mopers. We're not called to be complainers. We're called to talk about our problems because there's a purpose for our problems. We're not called to simply be sad all the time. We're called to talk about our problems because God wants to use them in a grander story than just the story of our life. And I'm going to tell you the truth today. There's some of you out there experiencing an affliction that it is not God's will for you to ever be healed. Did you hear me? Because he wants to use you. What is happening to my body? It's happening. It's happening. So put me in a wheelchair and call me Hot Wheels. We are going to keep proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus. Because my purpose doesn't change. And your purpose doesn't change because of the pain that you're going through. It doesn't change. But the way we react to it is important. I used to, uh, not used to, I mean a couple weeks ago I'm laying on my couch and a person can only watch so much Netflix and I'm going insane and I'm like, Lord, can you please help me? Can Can you please talk to me? Is there a sin that I have committed that has brought this upon myself? And God led me to a passage of scripture and and only a way that God can. And it's found in the book of John. And I would appreciate it if you would turn there now. And it's found in John 9, 1. I want you to see the red letters. I want you to see these words for yourself. Because these aren't my words. This isn't my message. The disciples and Jesus, they're out doing what the disciples and Jesus do. They're, They're healing people and they're being awesome. That's what they do. It's what God does. He's awesome. And so we have this moment before us where the disciples are trying to impress Jesus with their lofty questions and their, and their eloquent waxing and waning and whatever you want to say. And they're trying to speak boldly and smart in front of Jesus. And they ask the question when they come upon this, this person who was born blind and, and they say, oh, Savior, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because sometimes we believe that it's because of sin that we're sick, huh? Or that we have experienced something. Now listen to me, church. Some of the suffering in our life has come at our own hands. And you need to own it. Some of the suffering and pain that you are reaping, you can't blame the enemy for. You can't blame God for it. It's on you. But you know what? God's big enough for that, too. God can heal that, too. Because in this moment, Jesus' disciples ask this question, and Jesus looks at them with all the love and compassion in his heart, and he says, listen, neither this man or his parents sinned. He said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent this. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, what Jesus just said right there is sometimes bad things just simply happen for because. And when bad things happen because what the world means for evil, God will use it for good. And so maybe there's some of you out there this morning that are praying for the wrong thing. I think I'm praying for the wrong thing. I've been spending all of my time praying to be healed when my prayer doesn't need to be healing. My prayer needs to be use me. Because whether bent over, broken, straight, or standing, God can still use me. And he can still use you no matter what you have gone through. It doesn't mean you've sinned and God's angry at you. It means God loves you and wants to use you and include you as part of his story. Those words are read in your Bible. That means Jesus said them. And Jesus said, just because this man's blind doesn't mean he sinned. 
It's because God wants to show you how awesome he is. You know why sometimes things happen to us, church? And this is hard for us to understand. Sometimes things happen to us because God loves a great ending. It's hard when you're the star of that film. And I'm talking about you because you all have your pain. You all have the things that you go through. But Jesus Christ tells us, you know, the Bible also tells us we reap what we sow. But Jesus is telling us it is true for us to experience hardship and pain. And we are not sinful. Well, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> It's not because of the sin. You know, when we look at the Apostle Paul throughout this series, we're calling it Joyride, and, and trust me, it's going to get happier. We're starting way low this week so that we can really end epic. <laughs> Yay, get in the car with Pastor Jamie. <laughs> He's going to lose feeling in his legs when we're driving. All right. So we talk about Joyride. We talk about what does it look like for us to have joy. And as we're talking about Paul, Paul had this dream. He wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to preach in Rome. He wanted to preach to the multitudes in Rome. And, and so throughout this book, the theme of the book of Philippians really is joy. It talks about it in the four rites that we talked about. And we're going to cover it from a thematic standpoint. But see, what's really heart-wrenching about the life of Paul is when we look in the Old Testament, when we look in the New Testament, we see how there's all these like really cool stories. How like with Balaam, God used the donkey to talk, and that's a great story. They turned it into a cartoon, they called it Shrek, but that was God's story first. <laughs> There's the story of David and Goliath. You have this little guy who has a sling, and he takes five stones, and he confronts this giant man named, named Goliath, who, who is literally just trash-talking God, and he takes a little shepherd's sling, and, and he, God uses that little shepherd's sling in this most Hollywood-esque Steven Spielberg-style movie, and he slays the giant, and we all cheer at the end of the movie, and it's epic, and it's heroic, and then, did I already say Moses in this service yet? We talk about Moses and the staff of Aaron, and Moses and the people of Israel afraid. They stand on the shores of the Dead Sea, and the people are saying, what are we going to do? And God says, check this out. Boom! We love those stories in scriptures. We love the heroic tales. But we have a much harder time looking at the life of Paul going, did you see how God used his prison chains to set the captives free? Wait, 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 wait. That's not how the story's supposed to end. God doesn't tell sad stories. God doesn't use pain. God doesn't use sorrow. Well, listen to me, church, he does. God will use in some of your lives you're going to be blessed. Your socks are going to be blessed off. And you know what? Praise God for that. Use it to his glory. But for some of us in here, we're never going to experience healing. Sorrow and chains are what some of you have. And so the sooner we begin to talk about the sorrow and the chains and the things that we have in our life, the sooner we can begin to heal and, and use those things for the glory of God. God changed the world through Paul's prison chains. Not to mention Jesus Christ coming down and embracing a cross, dying for our sins. Anybody want to sign up for that story? Not me. God has and will always use pain for his glory. Because the world is evil, the, the world is broken, the world is sinful, and what the world intends for awfulness, God will transform it to something epic. Paul's life is that story. We find two accounts that I want to share with you this morning about Paul's life. First, I want to, before we jump into Philippians and in Paul's imprisonment, Paul didn't end up going to Rome as a preacher, he went to Rome as a prisoner. I'm sure Paul was sitting there going, yay, God, I'm here. Now I get to preach to the walls. Our pain's real, isn't it? These are the conversations we actually have in our heads, aren't they? In a moment, Paul is faced with another type of affliction. In 2 Corinthians 12, he's trying to encourage the churches at Corinth, and he says these words, and I want you to... To, well, we're going to have it up on the screen, I think, this one here. And it says in verse 7, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. Did you catch that? Things are going awesome for Paul right now. Ministry's good. 
And because of that, there has been a thorn placed in his flesh. Now, scholars aren't sure exactly what that is. Some scholars have made the statement that that thorn in his flesh is migraine headaches. Some scholars have said that that thorn in his flesh could have been a bacterial problem in his digestive system, and we'll just leave it at that. Some scholars have said that it's actually a physical person who has traveled around uh, being his enemy and harming him, beating him, robbing him. But the point is this. There is something in Paul's life that has the Apostle Paul asking God questions. He says, this thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, is the pain good? The pain is evil, but God is good. Amen? This messenger of Satan sent to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So there's Paul crying out to God. Whatever his affliction is, whatever your affliction is, he's crying out to God saying, take this from me. Heal me from this. I don't want this. I can be a better preacher if you take this from me, God. But what does God say to him? He says, no. I'm not going to take this from you. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. Oh. For some of us, we need to change our prayer from healing to use me. Do you understand how I'm saying that today? Trust me, because I'm going to be praying for healing. Because I believe in miracles. But I know God will use me. So here in this moment, the Apostle Paul reaches out to God, and God makes it a very clear fact that Paul's thorn in his flesh is is going to be painful. He makes it very clear that the thorn in his flesh is going to be humiliating. It's, it's, it's going to be debilitating. And it's permanent. So what is that thing in your life that you're trying to hide? What is that pain in your life that God has oof, blessed you with for the sake of others? You know, we come to this moment now in the church the Philippian church needs encouragement. Philippi is a place that is, it's, it's, it's a sports town, actually. It's kind of probably very similar to Pittsburgh. And uh, it's known for actually winning a lot of wreaths and championships, kind of, kind of like Pittsburgh. But he's writing to encourage them, and what he's encouraging them with is his current circumstances. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of Philippians with me right now. Because here Paul lays out for us the bedrock of what joy and suffering looks like. He says these words, found in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Did you catch that? What has happened to me really is here to serve as something to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear that this is here to serve for the sake of the gospel. It is a result, it has become clear that throughout the whole entire palace that, that I'm here because I'm a prisoner in Christ Jesus. What Paul's saying in this moment is, I came to Rome to preach to the multitudes, but God, you now have put me in proximity of Roman soldiers. You have put me in proximity of Roman governments and officials. I am speaking to people because of my imprisonment that I would never have access to. Do you catch what he says there? It has become uh, apparent to the entire palace guard. Where does the palace guard guard? The palace. He's living boldly for Christ, suffering boldly for Christ in the presence of those in leadership. And so in God's suffering, in God's pain, God has put him in proximity with people he would never be able to preach to. And the question I have for to you, to you this morning, is where God has placed you, whether in your suffering, whether in your blessing, has God placed you there because there's people there that need to hear the gospel message that nobody else can get to? Did you ever think about maybe the fact that God's using your pain to rescue somebody else? 
He goes on to say this. He says, because of my chains, now most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God. Did you know that when you share your story, you encourage other believers? You encourage other people? And and when we, as a culture, say it's wrong for us to talk about our pains, we're actually sinning against God and we're robbing people the blessing of hearing what we've experienced through our suffering? I was so blessed by a woman in our church by the name of Jane Gwaltney. So many people have brought us meals and have been taking care of my family. And and every time that door knocked, I have to be very honest with you, in a very prideful way, my heart got bitter. Because I'm not the one who's supposed to be getting meals. I know the problems and the pain that you have. And there's so many greater issues out there. There's so many greater pains out there. And I'm going to stop right there and address this. Listen, don't you dare compare your pain to mine. And don't you dare compare your pain to somebody else's. I don't care if you have a a hangnail or or you're on fire. Your pain is your pain. Your pain is your pain. You dodge it when you try to pretend like it doesn't exist or that somebody else has it worse. And so there your pastor lays. The doorbell rings and I become bitter. God spoke to me. Because what Jane Gwaltney said when she brought the food to us, she said, thank you for allowing us to serve you this way. It has ministered to me and my family to be able to love you like this. She leaves and I start bawling. Because she's right. When we hide our suffering, when we hide our pain, we're robbing it of the joy it deserves by allowing other people to bless us and allowing other people to grow in their faith. Maybe God wants to use your pain, your sorrow, to build somebody up. You know, I'm not proud of this. The other day I got a phone call from somebody and my body was in some serious pain. And I I get these moments where everything just locks up and I don't even, I can't even see straight. And I'm having one of these moments and I get a phone call and I should have left the phone according to my standard. I should have just not answered it, but I answered it. And there's this person on the phone talking about, hey, I got this person that needs to talk to somebody. They just, they're having a crisis in their faith. They need to talk to someone. And in my heart, I'm like, God, come on. I am in so much pain right now. Isn't there somebody else who can take care of this? I'm human. And in my heart, that was the reality of what was going on. And I was in so much pain. And I hung the phone up and I just said, God, will you please just work with me here? So I called the person. And when I called this person, they began to share about this broken story. how they've been wounded by the church and how they've been wounded by so many things. And as I'm sitting there listening to this person share their story with me, they called to to get help. But they were rescuing me. We need to share our pain because we never know who needs rescued. God showed me in that moment. Don't focus on the pain, J.B. Focus on what I'm putting in front of you because maybe what I'm putting in front of you is not what you think. Maybe it's not about, you know, you. Maybe it's not about this other person. Maybe there's a bigger story at stake here. And just as I thought I was getting called out to a work call, I was being ministered to. It's a church. Stop focusing on your pain and focus on the promise that we have that his mercies will be daily renewed and made new for us, that he will see us through. We walk around pretending like everything's okay and it's not. If you want to experience joy in your sorrow, embrace your sorrow. Weep. God is an emotional God. If he wasn't, it wouldn't say it in Scripture. He knew Lazarus was coming back from the dead, but yet he still wept for his friend. God knows the ending, but he still desires to weep with you. 
He, does, he desires for you to stop focusing on your pain and to focus on the fact that he is going to use you. You want to know why you don't have joy in your suffering? Because you're focused on the wrong part of it. If you want to experience joy, focus on the fact that God wants to use you. Throughout this last month of my life that I don't know where it's gone, <laughs> I've been reading scripture and listening to music and a song I came across, it's an interesting song, I think artistically it expresses that raw emotion that when we, when we pretend like everything's all right, I think this song expresses that. And I want you to think of your pain right now. What is that thorn in your flesh that Paul talks about? What is that thing that has been done to you that harms you? I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about it by name. Not because we're trying to get way down low here. But because we need a change of tune. So as you're thinking about that sorrow, that pain, that emptiness, that broken thing in your life right now, I simply want you to listen to the song. walk around with that visceral happy face, don't we? Crying out that everything's okay. But the reality is some of us are barely afloat, right? Listen to me. Your pain is real. Your sorrow is real. But God hasn't forgotten you. He loves you. He wants to pick you up. He wants to put the pieces back together. He surrounded you with people here that, that want to help in that process. Stop pretending. And ask God to heal you. 
more importantly, let your prayer become this. God, use me. I'm trying that prayer right now. I'm asking God, please, God, use me. I still want to be on the team. And a lot of time, our sorrow and our pain can lead us to believing lies that aren't there. Maybe God has forgotten or forsaken you. But remember, in our weakness, he is strong. God has not forgotten you. And in that, find joy. Because he loves you enough that he wants to use your broken heartache of a story and he is going to rescue others. But like Paul, you have to tell your story. Whatever you went through, God can fix it. And you have people that love you. So don't pray for healing for me. Please. Just pray God will use me. When I've had my weak moments over the past month, really the past several years, I've gone to one scripture that just reminds me that there's a much bigger story than me. Yeah, I gotta be tough about this, but you know what? It's okay to cry about it too. The words of Psalm 91 have just brought me such comfort. And he says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord that He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And surely He will save me from the fowler's snare. And he will deliver me from the pestilence. And I tell you, church, that deliverance may be death. That deliverance may be healing. But considering the promises that we have, that one day there will be no more tears, that one day there will be no more pain, that one day there will be no more sorrow, that there will only be joy, that there will only be rejoicing, that is not a bad thing. We have a promise for tomorrow. And it goes on to say that he will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. Whatever your pain, bring it to God and stop focusing on the defeat and find joy in the fact you've already won. God loves you. Leave here joyfully today because there's nothing Nothing that will stop our God.